Subscribe to our channel, press the bell icon and never miss an update from Latestly. sorry for all the suffering there's been uh, throughout this pandemic, whether it is constituents or anyone uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, as to his, his points about uh, what is in the report, I don't think his views are substantiated by, the, uh, by what the report says, but I think he should wait to, he should wait to see uh, where the inquiry goes, and that's what I propose to do. So of course, uh, it's, it's vital that we make this statement. Yes, of course, it's vital that we uh, learn from Sue Gray's report, vital that we take action, uh, Mr Speaker, which is what the government is doing. But it's also vital, frankly, that we get on with the people's priorities, and that is what this government is also doing. Speaker, I'd like to thank Sue Gray for the diligence and professionalism with which she's carried out her work. It's no fault of hers that she's only been able to produce an update today, not the full report. The Prime Minister repeatedly assured the House that the guidance was followed and the rules were followed. But we now know that 12 cases have reached the threshold for criminal investigation which I remind the House means that there is evidence of serious and flagrant breaches of lockdown, including, including the party on the 20th of May 2020, which we know the Prime Minister attended, and the party on the 13th of November 2020 in the Prime Minister's flat. There can be no doubt that the Prime Minister himself is now subject to criminal investigation. The Prime Minister must keep his promise to publish Sue Gray's report in full when it is available, but it is already clear that the report discloses the most damning conclusion possible. Over the last two years, the British public have been asked to make the most heart-wrenching sacrifices, a collective trauma endured by all, enjoyed by none. Funerals have been missed, dying relatives unvisited. Every family has been marked by what we've been through, and revelations about the Prime Minister's behaviour have forced us all to rethink and relive those darkest moments. Many have been overcome by rage, by grief, and even guilt. Guilt that because they stuck to the law, they did not see their parents one last time. Guilt that because they didn't bend the rules, their children went months without seeing friends. Guilt that because they did as they were asked, they didn't go and visit lonely relatives. But people shouldn't feel guilty. They should feel pride in themselves and their country, because by abiding by those rules, they've saved the lives of people they will probably never meet. They have shown the deep public spirit and the love and respect for others that has always characterised this nation 
at its best. Yeah. Our national story about COVID is one of a people that stood up when they were tested, but that will be forever tainted by the behaviour of this Conservative yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. By routinely breaking the rules he set, the Prime Minister took us all for fools. He held people sacrificing contempt. He showed himself unfit for office. His desperate denials since he was exposed have only made matters worse. Rather than come clean, every step of the way, he's insulted the public's intelligence. And now he's finally fallen back on his usual excuse. It's everybody's fault but his. They go, he stays. Even now, he is hiding behind a police investigation into criminality, into his home and his office. Mr Speaker, he gleefully treats what should be a mark of shame as a welcome shield. But, Prime Minister, the British public aren't fools. They never believed a word of it. They think the Prime Minister should do the decent thing and resign. Of course he won't, because he is a man without shame. And just as he has done throughout his life, he's damaged everyone and everything around him along the way. His colleagues have spent weeks defending the indefensible, touring the TV studios, parroting his absurd denials, degrading themselves and their offices, fraying the bond of trust between the government and the public, eroding our democracy and the rule of law. What I, think the, and, and, uh, what I think the country, with greatest respect to the benches opposite, what I think the country wants us all in this House to focus on is the issues that matter to them. And getting on, getting on Mr. Speaker, with taking this country forward. And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, today uh, we have delivered yet more Brexit freedoms with a new Freeport uh, in Tilbury, as I said, when he voted 48 times to take this country back into the, uh, to the EU. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have the most open society, most open economy. It's, Mr. Speaker, this is, I think, what people want us to focus on. We have the most open society, most open economy in Europe because of the vaccine rollout, because of the booster rollout. And never forget, Mr. Speaker, that he voted, uh, he voted to keep us in the European Medicines Agency, which would have made that impossible. And today, Mr. Speaker, we are standing together with our NATO allies against the potential aggression of Vladimir Putin when he wanted, not so long ago, to install a Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, a Labour leader who would actually have abolished NATO, Mr Speaker. That's what he believes in. Those are his priorities. Well, I can say to him, he can continue with his political opportunism. We are going to get on, and I am going to get on with the job.